Uh, thank you so much for, for coming here on this rather uh, Arctic day and navigating tube strikes and all other obstacles that have been <laughs> put here to stop us getting together. But um, it's fantastic to be here uh, for this important subject. And uh, thanks to Jude Kelly from WOW Foundation and Professor Joanna Bork from Birkbeck College for organizing this day. And I'm absolutely delighted to be chairing this panel. I've got two fantastic guests from across the globe. I have Rahima Mahmoud, who is there, and Professor Oscar Guardiola Rivera, both from areas where the subject that we're discussing is a major issue. Um, my name's Christina Lamb, and I'm chief correspondent of the Sunday Times, and uh, I also write books. Uh, one of which you might have heard of because I wrote it with a very famous recent bride. Uh, it's called I Am Lala. <laughs> um, and my most recent book is about the subject we're talking about today, sexual violence in conflict, and that book is Our Bodies, Their Battlefields, What War Does to Women. Uh, Rahima, Rahima Mahmoud is a Uyghur singer, translator, and prominent human rights activist. She's worked closely with Uyghur women that have survived sexual violence and torture in China's concentration camps, translating their testimonies during the Uyghur tribunal, and working on the groundbreaking BBC news story on systematic rape in the camps. She's also UK director of the World Uyghur Congress, executive director of Stop Uyghur Genocide, and advisor to the Interparliamentary Alliance on China. We're also very lucky to have her here because she's performing <laughs> later um, as a musician, so she may tell us a little bit about that. Uh, and then next to me, I have Oscar Guardiola Rivera from Colombia, who is Professor of Political Philosophy and Human Rights at Birkbeck College. He's also author of a number of books, including the critically acclaimed What If Latin America Ruled the World?, most recently, he wrote an account of peacemaking in Colombia entitled The Long Road and the Promise, the Colombian Peace Process as an Example of Aesthetic Justice. And this year, the poetic novel Night of the World, which I can show you. Um, and he is also a fellow of the RSA, a commentator for Monocle Radio, and a columnist for the Colombian newspaper El Espectador. I'm not sure if he also has a musical performance <laughs> later. <laughs> you do. <laughs> Good. Goodness, I, I'm feeling left out. I don't play anything. <laughs> so, um, sorry, so, so our topic today is rape as a weapon of war, which is a subject extremely close to my heart. I've spent 33 years as a war correspondent, and I've always been much more interested in the people behind the lines and how they feed, educate, protect the elderly, and uh, feed and educate children as all hell is breaking loose around them. The people doing that, of course, are usually the women. And to me, they are the real heroes of conflict, although you won't find any statues to them. Indeed, histories of these con conflicts are almost always told through the men, and women's voice is far too often left out. And sadly, there's a darker side of what happens to women in conflict, and that is the rape and sexual violence carried out by soldiers and militias. Over the last six or seven years, I've come across stories of such brutality towards women that I've found them hard to write. I think most of us know that feeling of walking down a dark lane at night and hearing steps quickening behind us or having a male boss push up against us at a work party or being the only one in a train carriage when a strange man walks in. So imagine what it must have been like to be in the Galaxy Cinema in Mosul where hundreds of Yazidi girls were kept after being abducted by ISIS fighters they were sorted into ugly and beautiful, and what terror they must have felt as those fighters came through and touched their breasts, touched their hair, as they decided which one they wanted to take. 
One of the girls I met called Naima told me she'd been traded 12 times between different fighters and she felt like a goat. She said to me she tried to kill herself several times and, and um, did not succeed. And she said, even death didn't want me. Rape, of course, has always happened in war. The ancient Greeks, Romans, and Persians were all at it. The very first written history by Herodotus starts with accounts of abductions of women. But we are in 2021. And it makes no sense to me that since 2014, I've seen more of this happening than at any time in my career. I mentioned the Yazidis, but around the same time, the Chibok girls in northern Nigeria, you might remember being abducted from their school in the middle of the night by Boko Haram fighters. Uh, when I went there to report on that, I found that that was just the tip of the iceberg, that tens of thousands of girls across northern Nigeria were being abducted. And then a few years later, 2017, I was in Bangladesh when the Rohingya crisis happened and around 700,000 Rohingya people fled across the border in just three months, most of them women and children. And every woman I spoke to me had horrendous stories of being dragged out of their huts, tied to banana trees and gang raped by Burmese fighters. This all made me really angry um, and as we know, rape is something that is underreported everywhere. But these women actually bravely came out and told their stories, even though they were so difficult to tell. And it was astonishing to me that nothing was done about it. So I started to investigate this, not intending to write a book actually initially, just because I was so angry and uh, baffled. And I ended up traveling around collecting testimonies from women all over the world. I went to 12 different countries on five continents, but honestly, I could have spent the rest of my life doing it, I think. It's such an epidemic. As we speak, there is ongoing sexual violence faced by the Tigray women in Ethiopia, uh, women in detention centers in Belarus, and the Uyghur community in China. So I, I'm going to turn over first to Rahima, then to Oscar, to make some remarks about their own particular relation to this subject. And then we will have, hopefully, some interesting discussion about the reality on the ground, what needs to be done about it, and um, time for questions. So, Rahima, please. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. It is a privilege to sit on this panel beside Christina and Oscar and to people whose activism I greatly admire. Today I'm here to discuss how the Chinese authorities have weaponized sexual violence as part of the ongoing genocide of my people, the Uyghurs. Since 2017, our homeland has been turned into a police state. A high-tech network of surveillance technology now covers every corner. There is widespread religious and cultural repression, and around three million of my fellow Uyghurs have been imprisoned in concentration camps. These camps are notorious for the horrors that take place within their walls. Humiliation, torture, rape, even organ harvesting. Of all the stories that have emerged from the camps, those that shocked the world the most were reports of the brutal and the dehumanizing sexual violence directed against prisoners. It has been the testimonies of these brave survivors willing to share some of the most intimate aspects of their trauma that have so often spurred the world into action. Rape has long been used by the Chinese authorities as a weapon and a tactic as they try to destroy Uyghur identity. It is not just a woman. As we found out when Abduwali Ayyub became the first male survivor to share his experience of gang rape. Being an Uyghur interpreter, has meant working closely with many of these survivors to ensure their stories are heard 
the first detailed interview I interpreted for, uh, that took place in 2019 in Turkey. When we spoke to a woman, uh, we called her Rukia, and uh, that had served four years in prison. Over the course of 11 and a half hours, she described how she was forced to watch the gang rapes of other prisoners, men and women. She also described a rape room, which was specially designed to carry out these evil violations. She told us that rape was so widespread and systematic in prisons, detention centers, and camps that she expected that around 90% of Uyghur women detained would have experienced it. This is because the Chinese authorities see sexual violence as another torture method to add to their arsenal. They do not recognize the humanity of their Uyghur prisoners. Many survivors will not share their stories because of the deep shame they feel at what has been done to them. Many are young women, worried they will be unable to find a partner, frightened they will bring shame to their families. This means that these members of our community are forced to sit in silence with their trauma, unable to share it with even their closest friends and families. So the second interview I wanted to highlight was one I did with Gulzira Awul Khan, a Kazakh camp survivor uh, who was forced to clean the rooms used by camp guards and interrogators for raping their victims. She spoke of how she would bring women and girls into the room, remove their clothes, and then fix their wrists to the bed before they were raped. Guzira's testimony was crucial, and it is now some of the most credible evidence we have from someone forced to assist in these atrocities. Later, Tursunay Ziyavudun came forward with her story after she experienced three gang rapes in the concentration camp. So it was that BBC report viewed by millions that propelled the Uyghur cause onto the global stage. Thank you, Rahima, for that very moving testimony. Oscar, can I ask you to say a few words? Uh, let me first uh, uh, welcome you all. Uh, thank you for being here. I know some of you have been waiting for a while, so I am very thankful for the fact that you did not decide uh, to uh, leave us. Thank you to uh, Rahima and to Christine, and of course, many thanks to uh, our much admired Joanna Burke, for helping us uh, creating this space for breathing. Uh, what I want to do is very simple and very short. I just want to introduce you to uh, Luz Marina Bejarano. Uh, but before I tell her story, or the story uh, that I've heard from her and others uh, like her in uh, my home uh, country in Colombia, uh, I would like to very kindly uh, invite you to avoid two elements which are too commonly used in order to report or narrativize stories such as hers. First, I would like you to steer clear from uh, the uh, uh, very uh, uh, familiar notion that this kind of war uh, is or could be characterized as so-called new wars, meaning no longer interstate wars, but just wars between uh, small, uh, a small minority of bandits and uh, states that perhaps uh, lack proper institutionality, uh, strong values, and or uh, state presence in the territory. And I would like you to avoid that narrative because it is exactly the other way around. Wars happen in countries such as mine, uh, not because there isn't enough state presence, but actually because of a state presence. It's just that that presence, uh, more often than not, uh, takes the shape of uh, 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 law enforcement and armed forces presence. And more often than not, 
the uh, law enforcers and or uh, armies are of the state are there in order to defend the uh, interests of investors. And more often than not, they happen to be foreign investors, for instance, a Canadian mining company and or a uh, mining conglomerate from the United Kingdom. Uh, this is very important because uh, it helps us appreciate why rape as a weapon of war is not something that has always been there, is not something that uh, happens in countries, and this is the second element that I would like you to avoid, which are somehow backwards, which are developing any or underdeveloped, uh, any of those markers of uh, assumed uh, backwardness. So the spatial element, oh, this only happens over there, those exotic countries in which people do dance very well but are, are also very chaotic because they have no proper institutions, no rule of law, no human rights, and so on and so forth, and or else this happens back then. You know, those countries which are still uh, uh, on, the, in, on their way. And only if they were to espouse our values, the rule of law, human rights, democracy, blah, 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 then that would solve the problem. Now, let me exemplify this uh, by means of her story. When Luz Marina was eight years of age, she escaped through the window of her house in uh, a small corregimiento, a very small village near Barranca Bermeja in the uh, 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 west of the country. And uh, uh, she escaped because she wanted to take a bath in the river. So she went and took a bath in the river. What she did not know is that the far-right paramilitary, which always works, work in cahoots with uh, the army and uh, do the bidding of uh, these uh, investors and the state, had issued an order, this is important, an order. They issued an order that nobody could go to that river. So when she was there, she was found out by three members of the far-right paramilitary who proceeded to rape her. She was eight years of age. The story only begins there. Her story only begins there. She was left for dead. She was found by a matriarch uh, of uh, the community. This is also very important. Many of the, of the uh, communities I am going to uh, talk about or I'm referring to uh, tend to have matriarchal lines, Afro-descendant matriarchal lines and or indigenous matriarchal lines, my own family included. So she was taken by her, healed, the woman who found her was a healer, and she then, Luz Marina then, uh, decides to uh, 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 follow uh, their family because they were told that they had to leave, otherwise the paramilitary would strike again. So they leave to a town called Barranca Bermeja, which is the oil production hub of uh, Colombia. And uh, there they are welcomed by the union, the local union, La Unión Sindical Obrera. And the local union provides, together with the matriarchs, uh, care services and healing services. Then the paramilitary strike again. This time they enter the neighborhood in which the uh, union's headquarters were located, uh, and uh, they gun down most of uh, the people who they found in uh, the building, including Luz Marina's sister husband. So her father and mother decide to take the family, together with many other families, across the border. So they flee the country and they cross into Venezuela, which is the neighboring country. So all these stories you hear about uh, Venezuelans crossing into Colombia, well, only yesterday it was the other way around. Uh, and for very similar reasons. Millions of Colombians left. Uh, and when they uh, thought they could come back, then they, uh, Luz Marina joins the local party, uh, Unión Patriotica, the local party that had been set up in between the 1980s and the 1990s 
uh, as a way for the revolutionary armed forces of Colombia to, uh, to give up arms and enter into uh, civilian life. But the entire party was uh, uh, eliminated. The entire party. All of them. Only a few survived. Luz Marina was one of the few who survived. So she flees again. This is her third or fourth forced displacement. And uh, she moves uh, uh, closer to the capital, Bogota. There, again, uh, through uh, the self-organized uh, uh, community institutions uh, and the unions, she begins to uh, study as a uh, communications technician. She joins uh, then a uh, community radio station and uh, uh, as such she then uh, begins uh, her activism together with other uh, mostly uh, female-led uh, community organizations. And as part of uh, uh, that uh, organization, uh, she joins the so-called Proceso de Comunidades Negras, PCN, a wonderful organization, the Black Communities Progress, or Process, rather. Uh, a and she begins to work on healing uh, communities affected by stories such as hers. Uh, she uh, tells us that uh, in that organization, within that organization, she found many women who had uh, stories that were she says, worse, much worse than theirs. For instance, that of uh, uh, a woman whose husband, three sons, two daughters had been killed and or raped. But it is, in within, uh, it is within this uh, organization that she begins to combine what she calls the ancestral heritage. This is a method, a way a historical memory, a technique of healing, together with psychosocial work. And then she joins, the, uh, uh, as part of that group, and using those techniques, she joins the uh, peace uh, process. I met her in uh, San Sebastián, in Spain, as part of a Channel B uh, negotiations between uh, the left-wing guerrillas and the state. Channel B negotiations tend to be secret. They tend to be very um, interesting. And what was most interesting for me, at least, was to see uh, with, my own, with my own eyes how is it the case that mostly women were leading the peacemaking process. And there I will uh, leave uh, uh, this small narrative. This is the story of Luz Marina, now, last year, uh, she had her first son. Thank you, Oscar. And we'll definitely get into women in peacemaking processes <laughs> later on, because I think it's a very important part of this. Um, I guess the first question to ask here is, I mean, you mentioned, Oscar, about it not just happening in far off places. I told you that I went to 12 countries on five continents. Um, some people, I'm not sure, many of you perhaps are too young, but for many of us, the first time that we really heard about rape being used as a, a weapon in war was Bosnia in the 1990s, just a couple of hours flight from here. Uh, and frankly, I, find, uh, I haven't found a single conflict or war anywhere where it hasn't happened. And actually, I've traveled quite a lot recently with my book, I was in Poland last week. Everywhere I go, people come up to me and say, my grandmother was raped by the Germans and never talked about it, or you know, this is something that was just kept quiet for so long. So I said that I felt there was an epidemic of this. Do you feel that, Rahima? Do you think that it is something that's happening more and more? Um, and why do you think it's happening? Thank you. Um, well, as you have mentioned earlier, this is a kind of weapon that was used against women historically. And at the moment, I if I uh, just talk from the Uyghur people's point, that we are completely under siege. 
So um, what I spoke about, the, um, the camp uh, prisons, but also Chinese government, for example, they did this homestay program since 2014 is as part of control the Uyghur population, also monitor their religious belief or whether they, have, uh, they are um, infected by extremism, this they call it. So they send cadres to, to, to families. One million Han Chinese cadres, they're mainly male, sent to the, the, these, these families. Most of this family, male, already put in prison. So this is a kind of sponsored kind of rape is happening. And it, the reason, um, when we asked uh, Tursunai Ziaudun, who was so brave to um, expose what happened to her, and uh, she said it's part of the way to destroy us. Because once a woman uh, raped, experience it, they feel they're worthless. So that is a kind of uh, part of the Chinese government's um, policy was leaked from the, the leaked document in 2019, break their lineage, break their connections, break their um, uh, origin. So this is a way of also breaking people, um, their spirit. Thank you. O Oscar, why do you think it was used so widely in Colombia? Well, it was used so widely in Colombia for the very same reasons it has been uh, uh, used so widely everywhere. And you pointed at that, but I, I, I prefer the way you put it in, in one of your books. Their bodies are battlefields. They're not just weapons. They are the very spaces in which uh, wars are fought. And these, fo these wars are fought for, uh, to put it very bluntly, uh, colonial reasons. So what you have uh, behind, what you find behind stories such as Luz Marina's is the persistence of both external and internal forms of colonialism. Meaning it is not a coincidence that as uh, the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and that of the uh, uh, newly appointed a special peace jurisdiction, an institution that we created as part of the, the 2016 peace agreements, uh, the rape is uh, uh, now considered not just a weapon uh, to be causally connected with, for instance, counterinsurgency efforts, uh, but rather a form of domination of peoples and territories, precisely what uh, Rahima was describing. And uh, it is not a coincidence to repeat that uh, this happens mostly in uh, territories such as the Pacific Coast, in the east of the country, and or in the west, which are almost always uh, inhabited by Afro-descendants and or indigenous peoples. Of course, and this is when the language of law is very limited, we're not talking about minorities here, because of course, they turn out to be the majorities in, in uh, 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 these countries, in fact, in the world. And, uh, but it is in these territories where you would find the coal, the rare earths that are used uh, in uh, order to assemble your Apple iPhone in China, uh, and or uh, the lithium salts, and uh, by the by, let me here invite you to attend a performance of a play titled Rare Earth Metal, which is now uh, 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 being performed at the Royal Court uh, Theatre, because it is about precisely the extraction of these materials. So that's the short answer to your question. Why is it happening uh, more and more? A, because uh, it is being reported more widely and better because it is being reported by the communities themselves. But B, it is happening because rape happens as part of the global political economy that produces our beloved iPhones. So it is uh, uh, because in these parts of countries such as Colombia, you would find those materials, gold, silver, rare earths, coal, oil, that is why you find stories such as those marinas so often in these parts of the world.
That's certainly the case in the Democratic Republic of Congo, too, where a lot of the militias that are using rape are using it to drive people out of areas because those areas have the things that we use in our iPads and um, phones. But it is also in other areas where it's being used. I mean, Rwanda, where it was ethnic, um, Bosnia, um, other places like ISIS using it against the Yazidis, that wasn't to get control or for colonial reasons. That was because of religious reasons or religious propaganda where they were told that the Yazidis were devil worshippers and that it was their duty. Um, I guess that's one of the things that I, I see a difference from earlier times that a lot of things I've been reporting on recently people have actually been instructed or ordered to carry out rape. It's not rape that's happening um, amid the chaos of war. It is a systematic um, weapon. It is systematic. Uh, I, I did uh, uh, refer uh, with a purpose to uh, the part of Luz Marina's story in which she uh, talks about the order that, is, uh, that was issued by the paramilitary. And the interesting uh, development, the interesting legal development in considering rape, uh, not just as a, we as a weapon in direct causality to war, but as a form of domination, is that it includes the sorts of uh, 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 events that you are describing. Of course, it happens not only in places where you will find the mine, but it will also uh, happen in places where these communities extend uh, as spaces and or networks of existence. And uh, it happens for religious reasons because of course, and the Americas are perhaps the clearest example of this, colonialism always happens. I mean, no colonial settler uh, will tell you that he or she or they went there because they wanted uh, uh, gold and the rare earths. No, they'll tell you that they're doing so for your own good, for instance to bring you the good word of the Bible. So uh, uh, religious reasons, when you speak to these communities in places like, in places in the, in the Americas, well, religious reasons, they interpret them, we interpret them as part and parcel of this uh, 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 network of events, of the occupation of vital spaces. And vital spaces do, as, as Rahima pointed out so correctly, include first and foremost the uh, community fabric, the historical memory, the social textile. And it is not a coincidence that uh, uh, women are uh, targeted first because more often than not, they are the ones who perform roles as healers, uh, memory workers, storytellers, and political leaders, uh, something that is very interesting about indigenous peoples in this part of, of uh, uh, the Americas, uh, but also others, is that, for instance, you would find women uh, playing the uh, high-ranking political roles of their communities. And uh, the young would be uh, the sort of generals of their guardianships, of their uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, security uh, uh, devices, and the elder would be the low-ranking soldiers. It's a very interesting decentering of our familiar hierarchies. Rahima, you spoke very powerfully about the women feeling broken and about the shame that they feel. Um, this conference is called Shameless. I think one of the things I found most heartbreaking in reporting this subject is that um, the way that women have suffered these terrible things are then often ostracized for the community or made to feel that they did something wrong, um, particularly the, the girls in Nigeria who were taken by Boko Haram. Um, often when they were rescued by Nigerian soldiers, the soldiers then raped them. Then they went to camps and the communities wouldn't take them back because they saw them as being um, brainwashed or sullied and the only way that they could actually survive was to sleep with the camp officials to get food. So th these young girls are uh, really being victims over and over again. It's incredibly sad. Um, probably you heard about the Yazidis where the communities agreed to take the women back but wouldn't take the children back. So they've had to make this terrible choice of whether to stay with the ISIS captors uh, keep the children or leave the children behind and be able to go home. 
Um, can you talk a little bit, Rahima, about you know what it does to to women and and what can be done to support women who've gone through this? Yeah, this is a, it's a hard part of how we can change and how we can support. It's extremely difficult. Um, I agree with what Oscar said about this kind of colonizing and uh, controlling as part of the weapon. And also for uh, a lot of time people ask me, why Uyghurs, why your community were persecuted so badly, so terribly? Because Uyghurs are very proud of our own identity, our language, and uh, uh, we want to preserve that. We didn't want to be assimilated, although we were very much integrated, but that was not enough. So uh, a part of the resistance is because of the, the pride, being Uyghur. And so part of the weapon to destroy that is rape. And also the um, Uyghur culture and, the, and most of the Muslim cultures, men feel proud to protect their women. So when their women is raped, men also feel being destroyed. So this is a kind of consequences of the whole community to feel so ashamed that they are so weak that they, they cannot uh, protect themselves. So it's in a way to break their spirit and break their um, resistance, the power of resistance. Um, I worked with these, these women, we are trying to support them and they are very lucky to be alive, to be here in, you know, in the West. But what is happening to the Uyghur women, majorities in uh, my country, it needs international support. Because we know that there is no aid, no uh, support can go in because China completely blocked the, the journalists not, 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 not allowed to, to, to go in. No Uyghurs there to speak to any foreign journalist. My family, uh, my brother, when I spoke to last time, was in January 2017. Said, we leave you in God's hands. Leave us in God's hands. I cannot communicate with anyone. Later, I learned of many families, many Uyghurs detained because they spoke to uh, their families or friends abroad. Is your, your family still there? Yeah, I have. Uh, I was the only person left later. My son joined me. Uh, my entire uh, family, brothers and sisters, and everyone is there, still living there, but I don't know what happened to them. So under this kind of situation, it's extremely difficult to ask for even like organizations can go there to, to, to support them. And the, maybe uh, from my own um, activism, I believe that um, the government, so we need to put pressure on government. So awareness raising and then people, uh, the people's power, we have to um, create kind of movements and uh, put pressure. Uh, I think uh, in that way, there might be some kind of changes that happens because China is now behaving in such a way because of its economic power, because the West and many other countries dependent uh, on China. And uh, that chain has to be broken. That has to be. And uh, that is our consumer power as well, through our consumer power and also through us to put uh, pressure on politicians to not having this uh, trade uh, as usual. The sanctions, I w believe, uh, will work. And also like uh, uh, Magnitsky, uh, Magnitsky sanctions. So far, UK and EU only sanctioned four people. But there are many, we have names of the officials who are actually ordering these, these uh, criminal acts, and yet they, 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 they are not being punished. So this is, a, uh, uh, this is what I think is more effective. Talking about the, the need for international support and uh, the lack of justice, I mean, one of the reasons that this is happening so much is because of the, the widespread impunity. Every woman that I spoke to 
uh, every survivor told me what she wanted was justice. I think that means different things to different people. Sometimes it, it means acknowledgement of what happened. But the fact is that, that at the moment, accountability is the exception, not the rule. So maybe, Oscar, I could ask you to address that a little bit. Why isn't it being prosecuted? It is rape used in war is an international war crime. It's recognized as such by every member state of the United Nations. So why isn't that happening? And what could the international community be doing or should be doing? Let's say that there are two kinds of reasons why uh, that is happening. Uh, the first kind, I, and I would emphasize them, have to do with uh, the uh, uh, framework, the historical and uh, social framework in which these uh, events have been uh, uh, either criminalized and or, as you point out correctly, uh, criminalized in the books but not in action. And then the second set of reasons are of a more, let's say, technical nature and they have to do with what I already re referred to as the limits of uh, uh, law, courts, and even uh, international or para uh, transnational uh, uh, institutions. So as to the first ones, well, the, uh, the uh, perhaps uh, most uh, uh, clear way of putting this is to say, and forgive my uh, bluntness, is that uh, when it comes to these kinds of uh, events, uh, it is assumed that the bodies of women are tokens, that they have been, uh, continue to be, and will continue to be exchanged. Uh, and therefore, it is a bit like with poverty, when people tell you, oh yeah, I can understand your good intentions and your beautiful soul, you want to change the world, but those things have been with us since the dawn of time, and they will be there at the end. That kind of attitude is very widespread and incredibly problematic. And of course, it has to do with, the, with the, the fact that, for instance, we do ignore that uh, when uh, we uh, speak of you know, some of the first accounts of uh, violence against women, you mentioned Herodotus, well, for the ancient Greek, the ancient Egyptians were already very ancient. But when you look at the history of ancient Egypt, you find uh, 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 you know, stories such as that of Nefertiti. You, I'm sure you all remember Nefertiti. What uh, uh, is not told enough about Nefertiti is that she was a pharaoh. She succeeded her uh, husband, uh, Akhenaten. And in fact, she was erased of the record because she led uh, what could be called a cultural revolution. Something happened, and also, I, I don't tire to tell my students that they should go to the upper floor of the British Museum here in London, Go and inst instead of uh, looking at the mummies, look at a papyrus called the Hunefer papyrus, in which you can see the first image of justice that has, handed, uh, has been handed to us uh, in history, uh, thir uh, 1300 before uh, the Christian era. And it is not a coincidence that the figure of justice, the incarnation of justice, is female, Maet, which is a sort of hybridization in between mother nature and truth. So that's where the story begins. Something happened in between the ancient Egyptians and the ancient Greek, because when you get to the ancient Greek, women have lost already their uh, social status. Uh, and of course, Costas will correct me here because he's the expert on these matters. Uh, but uh, what little we know about the status of uh, the legal status of women in ancient uh, uh, cit uh, Greek cities in Athens tells us that they were already classified into uh, two, uh, uh, two uh, uh, places. One of them was as courtesans for uh, uh, wealthy peoples. The other, uh, the term here was porne, prostitutes. But prostitution was used as a way to bring democracy into the, into the ancient cities. I That's a very I long story, so I need to stop there. <laughs> yeah, I want to be able to open up to but questions. Very, but very quickly, just in terms of the technicalities. The problem with law, particularly international law, is that it reduces, it tends to reduce crimes 
to physical extinction and to individual uh, victimhood. And therefore, you have to prove that there is mens rea, causality, that someone actually uh, thought about these things, ca that very person carried these things through. So the idea that actually it is an order and it follows a chain of command which could be easily interrupted and, and so on and so forth, that is very difficult for law to uh, 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 you know, get a grip on. And that's part of the uh, technical problem why we have so much impunity. It's interesting what you were talking about with Nefertiti. I mean, it leads quite nicely on to, I think, if we just end our discussion on the, the whether this all links to needing more female participation in different areas, because every successful, and there have been successful prosecutions recently in domestic courts in different countries, everyone that I investigated had a female judge or a female prosecutor, which cannot be coincidence. So I want to ask you a little bit about, I mean, is it that we're not getting it right for women in sexual violence because we're not getting it right for women at any level? Um, so if you look at things like the International Court of Justice, they just appointed their fifth female judge in 20 years of history. That's the fifth out of 110, right? That cannot be, be right. Uh, Colombia, I think, is a good example where women have been very involved in peace processes. Uh, maybe if we can just wrap up our discussion with, if you just tell us a little bit about that, Oscar, briefly. Well, the reason is, of course, the self-organization and, and, and activism of women themselves. I mean, don't give credit to any of the uh, male negotiators that, for instance, uh, turn up to collect the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, because uh, women like uh, Luz Marina fought in order to open up a space within the wider space of negotiations so that the actual plight uh, and word of women could be heard. Because for many years, and as you know, negotiations such as this one take decades, the word was not there, and what you had was negotiations in between an all-male secretariat of uh, uh, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia and an all-male uh, uh, delegation by uh, the Colombian government. And uh, the tone, many of us notice how the tone of the negotiations began to change once the secretariat of the FARC acknowledged the fact that most of FARC's fighters were women. This is very important. The majority of the, of, uh, uh, the guerrilla, uh, including uh, mid-ranking uh, and uh, uh, you know, leaders of, of uh, fronts, were women. So they clearly put pressure on their very old uh, uh, men to uh, tell them, look, we have been running this thing, so it is up to us to do so. As a result of that, there was a space for uh, uh, women uh, uh, women's stories and uh, gender-focused uh, remedies. As a result of that, when the institutionality to carry, to realize the peace process was designed, uh, within the special peace jurisdiction, two elements were included. Number one, that the majority of the magistrates would have to be women. And number two, that there were specific salas or commissions for uh, violence uh, against women related issues. And so when you look at, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful contrast. When you look at all the, the courts in a, in, a, in a country such as Colombia, you have the Supreme Court, the Constitutional Court, and you have the special uh, peace jurisdiction. You, you see men, men, white men, white men, ah, women, and a lot of them women of color, most of them in fact. Uh, but that, that has to do with their activism, which is why the final bit of Luz Marina's story is so important. But it is also important to, re to recognize that they are appealing to what Luz Marina calls the ancestral heritage. You know, these old historical uh, ways, very concrete techniques of healing and conflict resolution. If legal educators, negotiators, uh, and other legal operators 
took were to take seriously those uh, notions, you would immediately see impunity coming down. I'm going to open it up now to questions. Uh, who would like to ask a question? There's microphones, so if you just put your hand up, uh, somebody will bring you a mic. Thank you. Um, thanks so much for the talk. I just wanted to ask you, Christina, you mentioned that um, a lot of the time when people are, women are like freed from, you know, cap being captured, like the um, Nigerian women, the Nigerian girls by, the, by Boko Haram, and I know it's happened as well with um, like Jewish communities uh, freed after World War II from concentration camps and ghettos and et cetera, that they're then often raped by the people who you know, free them. Um, and I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about kind of why that happens. And um, I know that you mentioned that, you know, a lot of the time when, you know, it's perpetrated initially, it will be due to um, orders given. And I'm just kind of wondering why it happens by the people who rescue them. Well, that's a very good question. I mean, I think some of it is, I'm afraid, opportunism and taking advantage of vulnerable people. And I'm afraid we've seen peacekeepers doing that, um, UN peacekeepers, and recently World Health Organization people in DRC who were supposed to be um, helping people with Ebola and were actually sexually assaulting the very vulnerable people that they were supposed to help. So that um, it makes things very difficult, I think, when when that's happening. So, um, you know, I'm afraid it is a, a sad fact that there are some, I guess, bad people out there who want to take advantage of um, of people who are vulnerable. Do either of you, Rahima, would you like to say anything about that? Um, well, I agree with you completely, and. Uh, uh, it's very difficult for normal people to understand, of course, these behaviors, but it's uh, quite also cu cultural background as well is quite important. When uh, this is backed by the regime, it makes it easy for, for the people, uh, for those uh, evil to, to, to carry out. Um, two, three weeks ago, I um, came face to face with an ex uh, policeman chinese policeman um, who actually carried out arrests and torture and he also explained that that in fact many police doesn't even want to go to work in the end but they were put on so much pressure like to capture more to torture more to do more so uh, apart from this kind of evil human nature, also when it is sponsored by a regime, by a powerful regime, that they know that they, ha they can get away and they, you know, this is, this is happening so, so in a such large scale. Personally, I think there needs to be a lot more research done on perpetrators. I mean, there, there's not anywhere near enough reporting on, on, on the victims, but there's almost nothing on, on the perpetrators and why people do this. And even I'm, I'm talking about people who are ordered to do it, but, you know, and sometimes they're doing it in remote places where there isn't really any, you know, wouldn't, they could refuse to do it. They could just not do it, and yet they're doing it. So... I think it, it, we need to know a lot more about You're that. You're very right, Christina. In fact, a brilliant element of your very brilliant question is why there isn't any hesitation, since this is an order coming from above, why there isn't any moment of hesitation when the order reaches the lower ranking uh, members of law enforcement agencies? Well, one potential explanation uh, in to use the concrete case of Colombia again, is the motto of the police, of the law enforcement agencies, is God and fatherland. So, you know, from the very beginning, their ima the imagination is being framed as all female. 
the composition of these uh, of these uh, organizations, all, all male, sorry, and the, co the composition of these organizations is uh, almost always all male, and there is a clear association between the defense of the country, meaning the fatherland, and the defense of a male-centered gender uh, uh, division or structuration of society, which is why also it is not a coincidence that the rise of the far right in the Americas, whether it is Trump in the United States, uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Mr. Duque in Colombia, or, God forbid, Kratz in Chile, which might very well be elected uh, president next year, what you see is that in their speeches, in their political agenda, the first item is women bodies control. So no to abortion, for instance. And immediately you have the church and the tremendous weight of the church behind them, uh, and you have all that ima imaginary reaffirmed. This is why when the rescuers, which are these law enforcement agencies, arrive, very often they just repeat what the other perpetrators have done. Um, more questions? I think there's one just here. Is it on? Oh, <laughs> I couldn't hear it. Um, so, thank you all for such like a really interesting talk. I find all of this, um, I've learned a lot, and I really appreciate you all coming here. Um, I was particularly interested in what you mentioned, Oscar. You spoke a lot about women's activism, and you also said that, like, the reason, one of the main reasons that some of these people are not able to be kind of uh, judged in court is because of the mens rea element aspect, because it's so, like, high in terms of rule of law and all of this. So, do you, this is a bit <laughs> controversial. Do you then advocate for a lesser mens rea um, kind of aspect in terms of the judicial process? Not necessarily. Perhaps the best way to put it would be to, on the one hand, acknowledge the distinct nature of uh, international criminal law and uh, international human rights law. And on the other, also to acknowledge uh, their intertwinement. Because the thing with law is uh, that uh, uh, if it is a tool, then it can also, it depends on how you wield it. Uh, it might be a weapon of, uh, of war and dominion, or it might be a weapon of liberation. And for instance, something that uh, the uh, mostly female-led uh, uh, judge, uh, judges of the special peace jurisdiction have been doing in Colombia is they, they marry interpretations of international humanitarian law with international human rights law using the, the Yugoslavian uh, uh, precedents in a way that allows them to uh, circumvent, at least to a certain extent, the uh, reductionism of forms of genocide to the pure and direct physical extermination of peoples. So, for instance, they are developing, uh, and they were developing notions of ecocide well before uh, uh, the uh, notion, that the draft that was uh, circulated and made public uh, uh, earlier this year here in the United Kingdom. And that is also why you have such interesting decisions such as the our land association versus Argentina decision by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which brings together the right to life, the right to health, and the right to the environment to speak of uh, these kinds of violations, rape in particular, as part and parcel of the creation of an environment of violence, an, envi an atmosphere of war. This is wording that comes from the Yugoslavian Rwanda uh, tribunals. When you do that, you can create a multi-causal uh, 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 space, and so you're not led or limited by sort of one-way causalism that is uh, so often uh, to be encountered in reductionist conceptions of uh, criminal law. Uh, that is one way in which uh, one could uh, uh, perhaps 
uh, allow for a more expansive and uh, better uh, treatment of these issues. Who else would like to ask a question? Uh, just here. Uh, thanks. It might be a bit of an obvious question, but I was just wondering why you would think that uh, women are so often targeted for rape. Is it just because we live in a misogynistic, patriarchal society, or do you think there's other elements to it as well? Why? Sorry, why did you say why women? Why, no, why women in general. Oh, sorry, why women in general? So not white women, but just um, so often the stories of rape in war are about women, uh, you hear about men as well, but yeah. much less frequently. I mean, uh, we should say, and you, you mentioned it, Rahima, it, you know, it does happen to men too, and that's even more taboo. I think it particularly happens in detention centers. I've certainly interviewed um, people who have been in detention centers in places like Syria where it, it's happened, and actually recently, I interviewed um, a Mauritanian man who'd been in Guantanamo for 16 years without charge. There's actually a movie called The Mauritanian uh, about him. He underwent every form of torture, waterboarding, all sorts of things. Uh, when I interviewed him, I didn't realize that he had also been sexually assaulted in Guantanamo by female American guards. And he told me that that was actually the worst thing of everything that he, he went through, the, uh, um, worse than the waterboarding, everything else. He said he felt completely objectified and that he couldn't bear intimacy now. So, uh, so it doesn't just happen to women, but it is mostly m women. Um, Rahima, do you want to talk yeah, about that? Uh, I believe uh, especially um, when a regime carrying out genocide and the women are there, uh, especially uh, if I speak from uh, Uyghur women's point of view, we are very uh, important in the community, cultural carriers and teachers, um, you know, um, who resist more um, compared to men when it, is, um, when it comes to assimilation uh, and uh, come to, comes to assimilation. And that therefore is eliminating women, um, destroying their spirit, uh, that is actually uh, more important to when, when they have they plan to destroy the whole population. Because that, that is, in many genocides, that's, that's how it happens, because women are the cultural carriers. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? Have we got time for, okay. Sorry, I slightly, because we started at a different time, I slightly lost <laughs> um, count of what time we actually needed to finish. Uh, well, thank, just remains with me to thank very much for all of you for coming and um, being interested. I know this is a difficult subject, but it's something I feel very strongly that we need to talk about much more. It is massively underreported. And I can't thank enough my amazing panelists, Rahima, and um, you can go and watch her perform. Is it in the Barbican, did you say, this evening? Near yeah. Barbican, St. Barks, St. Yeah, Barks. at okay. 7.30 this evening. <laughs> yeah. And Oscar, thank you very, very much for both of your insights. So thank you.